A giant hydropower dam project on the Nile River is part a diplomatic row between Egypt and Ethiopia, which has gone on for years. Ministers from both countries as well as their neighbor Sudan met last week to address the issue. Did they come to an agreement? Let's find out in this episode of The Brief. Hello and welcome to The Brief, I'm Jafar Hasnan. The leaders of Sudan, Ethiopia and Egypt held an online summit on June 26 to discuss a decade-long dispute over water supplies from the Nile River. The summit was also joined by South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, who chairs the African Union. Now, leaders said they were hopeful that the African Union could help them broker a deal within weeks. Torches negotiations over the years have left Egypt and Ethiopia and their neighbor Sudan short of an agreement to regulate how Ethiopia will operate its Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, GERD or GERD. Now, the dam is worrying its downstream neighbors, particularly Egypt, as the Nile is almost synonymous with the country and supplies almost 100% of Egypt's water. So with the latest meeting between the three countries, did they finally reach a consensus or not? Will Ethiopia be able to fill its reservoir, but also, at the same time, protect Egypt's scarce water supplies? Will tensions in the region ease, or will we see the opposite? Is a military conflict an option for any of the countries? We will discuss all this and more in this episode of The Brief. But first, in order to set up the discussion for today's program, let's have a look at this report. Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan will agree to a deal to fill the giant Blue Nile Dam in two to three weeks, following mediation efforts by the African Union to broker a deal to end a decade-long dispute over water supplies. Negotiations over the years have left the two nations and their neighbor Sudan short of an agreement to regulate how Ethiopia will operate the dam and fill its reservoir, while protecting Egypt's scarce water supplies from the Nile River. Ethiopia's water minister said on Saturday that a consensus had been reached to finalize a deal within two to three weeks. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is being built about 15 kilometers from the border with Sudan on the Blue Nile, the source of most of the Nile's waters. Ethiopia says the $4 billion hydropower project, which will have an installed capacity of 6,450 megawatts, is essential to its economic development. Ethiopia's prime minister's office said that the three countries agreed that the Nile and the Grand Renaissance Dam are African issues that must be given African solutions. The deal to delay the filling, brokered by the African Union, ends months of stalled negotiations and signals the intention to solve the issue without foreign intervention. Ethiopia's statement said the African Union and not the UN Security Council will assist the countries in the negotiations and provide technical support. Cairo had appealed to the Council in a last-ditch diplomatic move aimed at stopping Ethiopia from filling the dam. The Council was expected to hold a public meeting on Monday to discuss the issue. Welcome back. As you saw in the report, tensions are high between Ethiopia and Egypt. What does future hold for this dam project? Is a military uh, option on the table or not? Uh, how would Ethiopia ensure Egypt gets its water supply, considering the fact Egypt uh, has a scarce resource of water? Let's understand this in a better way. Let's take a look at 
the map of this dam and the Nile River and where exactly Ethiopia is trying to build it. But before we do so, let me introduce our guest for today's program. Here in the studios, we have Mr. Isaac Ishutu Argov. He's a journalist, activist on Ethiopian socio-political issues. Thank you very much, uh, Isaac, for Thank joining for us today. Me. Like I said, first, let's take a look at the map. Okay. So you can help us understand what's going on in this map. Let's bring it on. Okay, so you have Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Ethiopia here and Uganda, Kenya. So I believe these three points are very important, correct? Yes, actually, this is the, the Nile River Basin as a whole, and it's uh, considered technically considered uh, the, the, the longest river uh, in the world. And uh, has two main sources. One starts from the lower Iberian countries, and uh, the one that starts from Lake Tana in Ethiopia is called the Blue Nile, and the White Nile is. The one that so comes, that's the Blue uh, Nile right here? Yes, okay. that's the Blue Nile. So these two main streams, the Blue Nile and the White Nile, uh, go uh, past through Sudan uh, and meet in Khartoum. And uh, they, they, they form the bigger uh, Nile River that goes all the way to uh, the Egyptian basin. Okay, so this is how this whole map, it's quite confusing. Uh, when yeah. I had my first look at it, uh, I was confused. Uh, which points are the most important or not. So, like you said, these are the most important points, the Blue yes. Nile. Yes, I would say uh, that this one is the most important because uh, the, the Blue Nile, the one that starts from Ethiopia in Lake Tana and also other tributaries from Ethiopia, constitutes more than 86% of the, the, the Nile water uh, in the summertime. But when it uh, is in the rainy season, it actually goes uh, above 90%. Of the water flow, so, so the, it, this it, this constitutes the biggest portion uh, of the water resource as a whole, and uh, the other one also constitutes almost like 12 percent of uh, the whole uh, uh, water resource on the Nile. Okay, and I believe uh, many treaties were signed in the past, but uh, I think it can be I think it can be said with certainty at this point that those treaties did not really help the case for any of the countries. So uh, let me introduce uh, our, our other guest for today's program. Joining us now from the United States, Utah, is Mr. John Mukum Mbaku. He is Brady Presidential Distinguished Professor of Economics, Weber State University, United States. He's also a non-resident fellow at Brookings Institution, also co-author of Governing the Nile Basin, the search for a new legal regime. And from Sweden, we have Mr. Ashok Swain. He is UNESCO Chair of International Water Cooperation and also a Professor of Peace and Conflict Research, Uppsala University. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, uh, for Thank being you. with us on this episode of The Brief. For now, Mr. Mbaku, let me come to you. Like I mentioned, yes. there many treaties were signed in the past, but they have not really helped the case for any of the countries involved in this dispute. Please tell me, why is that? Well, um, the most important of those treaties are the 1929 Anglo-Egyptian Treaty and the 1959 agreement between uh, Egypt and uh, uh, Sudan. One of the problems you have with those agreements uh, is that uh, uh, Ethiopia was never a party to any of those agreements. And uh, the other uh, countries, that this uh, upstream countries, were not directly a party because uh, uh, Great Britain was acting on behalf of them since those countries in 1929 were still colonies. The second problem with those treaties is that uh, the two treaties uh, allocate virtually all of the waters of the Nile River to Egypt and Sudan. Um, uh, in the 1959 agreement gr grants Egypt 55.5 uh, uh, billion cubic meters of water and uh, uh, Sudan 18.5 uh, billion cubic meters and then 10 billion cubic meters, that is the rest, uh, was uh, left over for evaporation and uh, seepage. Uh, basically, leaving zero water for Ethiopia and the rest of the other states. Unfortunately, uh, if you are Ethiopia, you would not uh, like that kind of an agreement because um, more than 80 percent, and sometimes during the rainy, rainy season, 
that percentage goes up to almost 90 percent of the water flowing to the Nile River comes from the Blue Nile, which is located in Ethiopia. So the, the idea there is that Egypt continues to use, Egypt and Sudan continue to use all the water from the Nile. Ethiopia supplies the water, most of the water to the Nile, but Ethiopia does not get to use uh, any of it. That is why those agreements have had a lot of problems. And in addition to that, the agreements also granted Egypt veto power over any construction programs on uh, any tributary of the Nile River. And I think that is the reason why many people who look at those agreements uh, independently believe that the agreements are not fair to the rest of the other countries. And that is why the, those other states have not been uh, eager to uh, accept those agreements. Okay. Now, before um, we move forward, uh, let me ask this question to Mr. Ashok uh, Swain. Please help us understand how is UNESCO looking at this water dispute? Oh, I think UNESCO has, uh, like any other international organizations or uh, any other uh, international institutions which are um, uh, interested in this uh, area, they are uh, looking, I mean, um, I can't say about the UNESCO itself, but I think it's all, 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 everyone who are interested in this area are looking at it, uh, uh, amicable, peaceful resolution of the dispute, uh, what is going on between Ethiopia, Egypt, and also Sudan. I think the reason is, uh, as uh, Professor Baku has already mentioned, that the, the treaties, uh, previous treaties, uh, haven't really included the major uh, riparian, which is an upstream riparian in Ethiopia, which contributes 80 to 90 percent of water to the uh, Nile River. It hasn't been using the water. It's a water uh, uh, per capita water use is uh, less than one fifth of the Egypt. Uh, it's also hydropower is uh, quite quite low compared when we compare uh, the e Egypt's water use. And I, we also need to know that the dam which is in question it doesn't take away the water from the river system. It's a hydropower dam. So it is going to, it's a massive dam, it's a, but the water will be in the system and water will be uh, using hydropower will come back to the uh, use of Sudan and Egypt uh, eventually. So the water is not going away from the system. So it's just the way how, uh, I think, uh, what the agreement or the discussion which has been going on um, among these three riparians, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan, they have almost agreed quite 90 percent of whatever the you know uh, has been on this issue. So there are a few couple of tricky issues are still left. One is actually if there is a long-term uh, drought season comes in because of the climate change and other reasons we are you know there is a fear that long-term drought season. How the uh, Ethiopia is going to really use that or uh, uh, give the water back to the uh, Egypt and Sudan to use or how much it will store in its own dam. And the other one is the conflict resolution. How, if there is any conflict arises, how these three countries are going to uh, address this? Because Egypt wants a proper conflict management mechanism, uh, which is the involvement from outside, while uh, Ethiopia wants to do it within. Because Ethiopia has been traditionally opposing from somebody coming from outside to dictate these things, and only recently it got agreed to the United States, and, uh, you know, coming in and uh, negotiating, which was not successful. So I think it's a, it's a, the overall idea is it's such a large project, a huge project. It's important that all these three countries use these resources peacefully and for the development of the um, you know uh, people there, rather than engaged in conflict. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, I, you want to say I would like to come in here. First, I, I want to make this clear. Uh, I mean, Egypt has five dams on the Nile. Uh, Sudan also has some dams on the Nile. Ethiopia has zero dams, uh, despite the fact that it contributes to more than 86% of the water flow to Sudan and Egypt. This is, I mean, this is very unfair. It has been very unfair for Ethiopia to, 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 to be... So Ethiopia uh, feels exploited. It, it has been exploited, and that's not the only thing here. I think uh, Egypt's uh, very uh, clinging to this colonial treaties of the, the 1929 and the 1959 that gives it veto power 
over all construction on the dam has been a, a very uh, discouraging factor for everyone involved. The Nile uh, belongs to all the 11 countries that it passes through, and all 11 countries have to have a say on it. But that is not acceptable for Egypt because they, they, they have a, a very problematic uh, tr understanding of uh, uh, considerable damage because uh, they, they have been given uh, more than 66% of the Nile flow uh, on history, which Ethiopia has not signed. And they expect Ethiopia to, to respect this. And uh, they have used lots of mechanisms back in history. Uh, they have been uh, used war. War has been used as one mechanism. Uh, the, their politicians have been discussing about destabilizing Ethiopia, uh, causing uh, division among uh, Ethiopian political groups. They have been using lots of methods. And one of them, uh, one notable, uh, was the one uh, politicizing the issue as if it was not really a water sharing arrangement, but it was more political, more warlike. And they, for example, the recent uh, event where they took this to, to the United Nations Security Council, this is just a huge politicization of the event. They uh, always seem to avoid the African Union uh, because the African Union could resolve this issue involving all the 11 countries that, that are involved in the Africa. But as an African citizen, uh, it, it, that's a continent that has uh, suffered from colonialism for decades. I really take offense that Egypt wants to cling to political uh, uh, colonial treaties uh, and uh, uh, rules of engagement and wants to stop Ethiopia from uh, creating uh, electric uh, access to more than 60% of its population that does not have access to electricity right now. And uh, from uh, uh, getting all the other uh, projects that it can uh, build over the Nile. And Egypt is very selfish in this. And uh, all, the, all throughout history, she has always understood uh, any, any type of sharing arrangement of the water as uh, 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 an inevitable danger, uh, an existential threat to Egypt. And this has been the one that has been really uh, elongating this process of uh, using this huge water resource. I would like to remind you that uh, Nile, the Nile, the, the Blue Nile, that is the one, the water in Ethiopia, constitutes more than 70 percent of the whole water resource in the country. And also, Ethiopia, the one, with its 110 to 120 estimated population, actually constitutes more than 40 percent of the Nile Basin population. Ethiopia has uh, great injustice have been done to Ethiopia, being expected to uh, respect a treaty that it has not signed. Very uh, illogical and very uh, full of injustice. So Ethiopia feels it was sidelined. And uh, I mean, it's interesting what you have said. Uh, although this dispute is over n a natural resource, uh, there is a political side to it. Now, uh, Professor Mbaku, let me come to you. Uh, Mr. S Mr. Swan, Mr. Swain uh, pointed out uh, that there are some tricky questions which uh, need to be answered. And one of them is how will these countries... Uh, find a uh, uh, resolution to this uh, problem. So how can we ensure a peaceful resolution to this problem, number one? Number two, can we rely on the African Union? Well, um, the most effective way to find a peaceful solution to this uh, problem is through negotiation. And those negotiations can only be effective if they are done within the African continent. The idea of... Uh, relying on outside uh, powers like the United Nations Security Council or the U.S. government to uh, bring that uh, into force uh, necessarily will not work. I believe that the most effective way for uh, this problem to be resolved is for Egypt, Sudan, uh, Ethiopia, and the rest of the other uh, countries, making uh, 11 of them, to get together and start talking about how to manage this uh, resource uh, from a regional uh, perspective instead of a national perspective. I think uh, part of the problem we have right now is that Egypt looks at the Nile as a national issue, and that is not really the way to look at the Nile. The Nile should be looked at, uh, or the management of the Nile Basin should be looked at as a regional issue, one involving all the 11 riparian countries. If these countries need additional assistance in negotiating a framework for the management of the waters and the resources of the Nile, they should look to the African Union instead of looking abroad. 
because the African Union is capable, uh, given the political will, to bring this uh, uh, problem to a, a resolution. Uh, the Nile Basin I I Initiative, uh, several years ago, began working on this uh, project to provide a, a legal framework for the management of the uh, uh, waters of the Nile. The problem was that uh, Egypt refused to sign this agreement, uh, both Egypt and Sudan refused to, to, to sign the agreement because uh, they were arguing that in order for them to sign the agreement, their so-called historical rights must be protected. Unfortunately, those uh, historical rights are based on those agreements that we mentioned earlier, which uh, Ethiopia and uh, most of the other riparian countries had nothing to do with them. And, and uh, so I think that uh, the most effective way to approach this problem uh, is to uh, understand that Ethiopia has already constructed the dam. There's nothing uh, anyone can do about it. Uh, second, to sit down uh, and negotiate this problem as uh, Africans uh, very carefully. I think that if uh, all countries involved in this uh, situation are willing to do so, keeping in mind that uh, every country has its own uh, existential uh, needs, and as a result, uh, no one country should try to argue that they have more uh, uh, interest in the Nile than another. If they do that, I think they can come up with an agreement. And there's already precedent, and that is the Nile Basin Initiative, which has been going on now for several years and has not succeeded because of the uh, 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 approach uh, carried out by Egypt and, and uh, uh, Sudan. Okay. Now, Mr. Swain, uh, let me come to you. How can countries such as Ethiopia and Sudan ensure that Egypt gets its water supply? I think they uh, need to come into an agreement. Uh, the agreement has to be uh, on the basis of uh, mutual uh, uh, trust uh, to some extent. Uh, and I think uh, as uh, previously been discussed, uh, probably African Union is the right uh, organization which can probably broker this uh, thing, broker this agreement. But as I have mentioned, this is not exactly a water sharing agreement. It is, it is only how to manage this hydropower dam. So it's a, it's a, the issue is much more complicated afterwards than what it is now. I think it's a much larger story that is not being looked at because I think the, the Egypt's issue is that Ethiopia will enter as a party into this river sharing uh, issue because Ethiopia has not been before in any agreement. So once this agreement is signed, Ethiopia will become a party. And once you become a party to this management of this Nile, uh, particularly the Blue Nile Basin, which supplies most of the water to the Nile River, and I think that's where they, these three countries need to sit together. The problem is that uh, both parties are becoming too much of emotional, too much of politicalized, and making too much of securitizing the issue. And I think they need to really look at it, how on earth they can really sit down together and make best possible use of the water, because the water is there, water needs to be, water can be developed, the dam has been already built, that there is a massive $5 billion dam, it cannot really go away, the dam will operate, if there is the kind of things like going to the Security Council, using the threat of the war, or Ethiopia saying that we will be uh, filling up the the dam without any deal. These are the kind of things which really makes things much more complicated and much more problematic to find a solution or find an agreement. And I think they also need to realize that Sudan is a country which has, which really carries a lot of power in this kind of negotiation. Any threat, any way of doing this, you can't really ignore the role of Sudan. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit more complicated, but I think both the countries, particularly Egypt and Ethiopia, are using more for their internal political consumption rather than trying to really make keep an open mind and to make a certain kind of, uh, of concession and to get into this agreement. 
agreement, which will really put the uh, foundation for the future cooperation in that region. And I think that's where the problem lies, how these two regimes in these two countries, because they are going through different types of crises, to get over that and uh, not, to in, not to engage the uh, Nile River into their political discourse in the country, rather than looking at as a regional or basin-wide cooperation vehicle. Okay, uh, interesting, interesting. Now, I'd like uh, to add a few points. Uh, coming to you, I say, about uh, the concessions part. Now, there is no doubt uh, water is an important resource for all the countries involved in this dispute. Yes, Egypt has had problems with the scarcity of water. So, how is Ethiopia going to ensure Egypt gets its fair share of the water? Is Ethiopia willing to make some sort of concessions or not? So I think it's the other way around. I think there is some, some, something that we really have to understand here. Ethiopia has always been open for diplomacy. Uh, Ethiopia has been very transparent when it comes to building the dam, uh, even though uh, that was not the case when Egypt built its dams because it had veto, veto power uh, back in history. But when Ethiopia built this dam, it has invited uh, Egyptian uh, scientists on the issue. It, Ethiopia has always supported negotiation. And Ethiopia actually strongly believes that this issue could be uh, uh, solved uh, within the African Union. We have confidence that the African Union could actually solve this. It's, it was actually Egypt all along that has always taken the issue to, to, to the Western countries and to organizations like the World Bank uh, to exert financial process uh, on Ethiopia. I mean, we have compromised a lot, even uh, if you look at the agreement that, uh, that is already reached, uh, I mean, in the last uh, few weeks ahead. I mean, uh, before, I mean, Ethiopia has agreed to a four to seven year filling uh, six-stage filling arrangement, which, which actually uh, Ethiopia has the ability to fill the dam within two years, but it has already agreed, I'm going to do this uh, within four to seven years, which is a huge compromise on the part of Ethiopia. But do we see this type of compromise when it comes to Egypt? Because Egypt actually does not want equitable distribution of water, because it considers equitable distribution of water as exis existential threat to its existence, which is actually fair. And just like you said, it's not Ethiopia that's really holding all the water and now it's sharing with us. Back in history, we have never benefited from this huge 70% of our water resource. And now we are just trying to share in on it. It's not, it's not like we're taking everything and giving to, to other countries. It has been Egypt that has taken more than 66% of all the water, despite not contrib having any contribution with the springing of the water. So it's actually Ethiopia that is asking for its share. And Ethiopia actually has uh, every right as a sovereign country uh, to, to uh, come up with projects that uh, benefits its uh, people, be it in, in, in terms of electrical uh, drums, be it in terms of irrigation, be it in other uh, sense. Ethiopia has the right, because according to the UN, more than 20, 22 million people in Ethiopia are living under the national poverty line. What does this tell you? Uh, more than 65 million people do not have access to electricity, uh, while having the biggest, the, the, the longest river, uh, basically, in the world. This is a, a very unfair uh, arrangement, and we believe we believe uh, the change of the status quo is a fundamental uh, principle and characteristic of the process of equality and justice. You, you cannot just uh, refuse to change the status quo and uh, claim uh, to have a justifiable, equitable water sharing arrangement because Egypt considers any sh type of sharing on the water as a, an existential threat. That's the narrative that they've been producing all along with the art, with the media, with everything that they've been doing, as if Ethiopia wants to uh, thirst Egypt. That is not the case. We Ethiopians believe that our lives are uh, just as important as Egyptian lives. And we also have the, the right to uh, use 70% of our water resource in the country. And that's only what we're doing. And I would like to remind you, uh, this, this dam also has benefits for Sudan and Egypt at the same time. For example, if you look at the UN report, more than 200,000 people have been affected by floods just last, last year in Sudan. Uh, and uh, 37,000 
thousand houses have been demolished because of the floods. The same thing happened in Egypt, where Egypt had to move some of its heritage because of the flood. And this actually, this dam actually uh, can regulate the flow of water and uh, in, uh, decrease uh, evaporation and also the, the amount of slick by 86 percent. This is a, a project that will save lives, uh, but it, it, the Egypt government is always like refusing to share this. And as an African, I say this, we cannot cling onto uh, colonial treaties that uh, do not have equitable sharing arrangements between uh, all the 11 countries matter when it comes to the, 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 the say on the Nile. And we all should have come and sit together. It was uh, Egypt actually does, does not want equitable sharing because it sees does not that want as, to be involved in yes, diplomacy. As, okay. as an existential threat. Okay. Uh, now... So Ethiopia is basing its argument on justice and equality. Now, uh, Professor Mbaku, you're joining us from the United States. How is the U.S. looking at this uh, whole dispute? Can the U.S. be a mediator? Well, the, the U.S. Has, uh, um, has tried before. I think uh, early this year, uh, the three countries, Sudan, Egypt, and Ethiopia, came to Washington. But uh, the, the, as far as I know, there was not really much of an agreement. And I think that uh, uh, in addition to the fact that uh, it's not a good idea for um, Egypt, Sudan, and uh, uh, Ethiopia to rely on external forces to negotiate this agreement, uh, especially given the fact that external sources are not going to understand the um, they are not the external sources are not going to have the the the, the, the kinds of uh, uh, facts that are necessary for them to come up with a good solution. Uh, the the advantage of negotiating this uh, agreement or this com uh, com agreement to this conflict in Africa is that it gives the three countries an opportunity to actually. Uh, get uh, the participation of local communities, people who who actually live uh, in these three countries and understand what is going on. That's how you come to an agreement, so that you have a buy-in of the agreement within the Ethiopian population, within the Sudanese population, within the Egyptian population, so that when you come up with an agreement, it will be easy for, you, for each uh, country to sell it. Going abroad uh, to the U.S., uh, a country that has a lot of problems right now. There's a presidential election coming up in November. The president is very preoccupied with that uh, uh, issue. Then you have the COVID-19, which is uh, which has become very devastating in the U.S. And the president is being criticized on how he's uh, 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 managing the uh, uh, problem. I don't think that uh, the U.S. is in a position at this moment to pay special attention to this problem. And particularly, if you, if, if you look at what the U.S. president has done during the last three and a half years that he's been in power, his foreign policy has not really emphasized anything in Africa. So if I were uh, 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 Egypt uh, or Ethiopia or Sudan, I wouldn't want to come to the U.S. and ask the U.S. to provide uh, assistance in terms of uh, uh, coming in as a mediator in this problem. What I would do is... I would go to the African Union, or I would try to get the three leaders to sit down together. I don't understand why the president of Egypt, the president of the prime minister of Ethiopia, and the president of Sudan cannot sit together and talk like Africans and try to see how they can come to the resolution of this problem. As I said earlier, if these three, uh, uh, if these three heads of state feel that they need assistance, they can call upon the African Union uh, for assistance rather than go uh, abroad. And part of the reason has to do with the fact that in Africa right now, uh, many people throughout the continent are continuously becoming more and more suspicious of the intentions of foreign governments uh, in Africa. And I think that trying to go abroad will, will only create situations in which even if there is an agreement, it will be very difficult for the presidents of each or the heads of states of each one of these countries to sell it to their local communities. Now, let me mention one other thing here. We have to be very careful in this discussion to know that, uh, to, to understand that there are two basic issues here. One issue, and that is the immediate issue, has to do with the fact that 
um, with the, the, the fact of filling the dam, okay? Uh, the second issue has to do with uh, developing a legal framework to manage the allocation of the waters of the Nile. Because the present issue that is filling the dam has nothing to do with uh, allocations of the waters of the Nile. Because as far as uh, uh, many of the riparian countries, uh, riparian states to the Nile are concerned, there is no legal framework that governs the allocation of the waters of the Nile at the moment. Yeah. It is true that Egypt and Sudan continue to argue that there is a framework, and that that framework is found in the two treaties. Uh, although in recent years, Egypt has started uh, bringing in the 1902 agreement between uh, uh, Great Britain and uh, Ethiopia. But the thing is that as, as far as most riparian countries are concerned, there is no legal framework. So once this issue of uh, how to fill the dam is resolved, then the next thing that these countries have to do is to sit down and solve the problem of allocation. And that can only be solved effectively if there is a legal framework. And that legal framework is one that is agreeable, not just to Egypt and Sudan, but one that is agreeable to all 11 riparian countries. It's only in that situation where uh, uh, on, uh, the problem, uh, peace can be brought to the region. And in terms of the feeling of the dam, uh, the Ethiopians, uh, suggested 47 years, and my understanding is that there is an agreement on that, and that the only issue associated with that is the, the issue of uh, long-term drought. What would happen if there is a drought? Would Ethiopia be willing to release water to allow Egypt to continue to have water from the, I mean, from the river if there is a long-term drought? I think my understanding is that that is the only issue that needs to be resolved and that the idea that Ethiopia should uh, extend the filling to 21 years, to 20 to 21 years, is something that I don't think Ethiopians would agree to, and I don't really see uh, uh, that as being necessary in terms of uh, uh, disagreement. Okay. Now, Mr. Swain, uh, let me come to you in uh, Sweden. Uh, developing a legal framework, I think that's very important, a great point raised by Professor M. Baku, but... The biggest problem is getting all parties uh, on the table, on the same page, to agree with that legal framework. How can that be achieved? Uh, shall we say, let's give the authority to some organization who can look after this agreement or something else? You see, this is a very long-term process going on in the Nile Basin. Nile Basin issue is not new. It has been going on for ages. Uh, there has been various attempts to create a Nile Basin-based uh, organization uh, which will really uh, develop the water resources and will make possible, best possible use of all the basin countries. Uh, Nile Basin Initiative, which has been, uh, um, all the 10 countries are the members of it, which has started in 99 with the World Bank. Uh, so that has, that is there. Uh, though there has been a common framework agreement, which are supposed to come into uh, 2010. That hasn't been, of course, there has been idea of a, a, establishing a Nile Basin Commission because that hasn't come because initially the opposition from Egypt and Sudan and now uh, Egypt. So I think it's, it's a somehow uh, the process goes uh, long back. But I have been always advocating that you need to first address the three countries, uh, those who are the three main riparian countries, uh, Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia's issue before moving in to make it a larger uh, basin-based issue. Because uh, as we have been discussing, 80 to 90, 86 to 90 percent of water comes from Ethiopia. Ethiopia has never been to party to any of these two agreements which have been mentioned before uh, between Egypt and Sudan. So it's a, it's a first, you need to go step by step. You first address the water sharing issue between Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan. The Blue Nile uh, issue or the Blue Nile Basin issue is a very different than the White Nile Basin issue. 
so I think it, we, we, because White Nile probably will more on the hydropower, uh, while Blue Nile will be also needing much more for irrigation. So there are uh, complications which exist between these how to manage these kind of things. But I have been for a long period of time advocating that the Nile Basin Initiative attempt of the World Bank was just to bring 10 countries together and try to find a solution because it's very difficult to find a solution between Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan. But that didn't work. That will not work. You need to first address Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan issue, then move on. And I think finding a legal framework uh, in general, the, there is a UN Convention on the Transboundary, or the, sorry, non-navigational, which is of international water course. But none of these countries have either uh, signed it or ratified it. So, the, so this, it's, it doesn't really make much sense that we, you can draw the conclusion from this. But the real problem, which is we have been discussing, the discussing even that is also the, in the UN Convention is that Article 5, which talks about the equitable utilization of water resources, while Article 7 in that UN Convention talked about not causing to significant harm to the previous historical use. So I think this is, uh, there is Article 5 favors Ethiopia, Article 7 favors Egypt. So in, in a sense, how you will able to get a certain kind of frameworks. I think it is always a very important, but as we have been discussing, this Grand Renasa Dam is not really taking away the water. It's not really dividing the water resources that uh, has been in the uh, 1959 agreement that 50.5, 55.5 billion cubic meters has been given to Egypt, 18.5 to give into Sudan. This is not giving any specific amount of water to Ethiopia yet. It is only storing the water and going through this dam, which will produce the hydropower. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process to start with, a process as I have been saying, that once Egypt and Sudan now re accepts the fact that Ethiopia is a legitimate upstream riparian country, which is also they have signed an agreement in a sense, so that will start the process for a, a longer, for a more comprehensive uh, more legal and institutional framework in the Blue Nile Basin and on the basin in general. And I think it's a start. The start has to be done. But the, for the start to be done, I think it is important how these kind of countries, I mean, we do understand that Ethiopia needs to use the water. We also understand on anyone that Egypt is quite highly dependent for a long period of time on this water. But I think the water is for everyone and the water is for that basin. So I think it is dependent that we, at the same time, Ethiopia uses this water and Egypt also feels comfortable that it is not really being devastated. Of course, there are other kinds of issues we can bring in to accuse each other in many ways. But I think it is, it is the important and imperative that when Ethiopia has built a $5 billion dam, it's, it's for the development. You don't start a development starting a war. That's not the question. That never takes place. So it is important that the dam has to be used in a much more cooperative way, which will contribute to much more development, which Ethiopia needs and the basin needs. So I think that's what is the point is. The point is not no one is denying or no one can deny the Ethiopian right to use the water because it's a basin country. It has the right to use the water, but to use in a way which will be much more in a much more cooperative manner rather than directly confronting each other, directly attacking each other and creating just the all kinds of political security challenges of really waging war on each other. That That's what really makes it feel, you know, doesn't really so fulfill the purpose. It's actually negate the basic purpose of building a dam. Certainly, and uh, military option is certainly going to exacerbate the situation at hand. I have many more questions for all of you, but unfortunately we are running out of uh, time. But I'd just like to add sure. like a very, very short point on this. Uh, Ethiopia's stand has always been one that really actually uh, is open for discussion. Since the starting of the construction of the dam, Ethiopia has op opened its doors for negotiation. But there has been a lot of... Uh, it's one of the strategies of Egypt to, to drag uh, along uh, the, 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 the negotiation, 
making it a long process as if they have no intention of agreeing to an equitable share of understanding. And that is the problem. I think Egypt, the Egyptian government needs to move out of its comfort zone and also look for other sources of uh, water inside. For example, underground water and also seawater are two sources uh, of water. I, I mean, alternative sources of water. I mean, uh, the uh, Nubian sandstone aquifer system, which I have on my uh, 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 note here, alone contains an estimate of 150,000 cubic kilometers of water. Uh, that can be utilized. They, they should look to ways of utilizing this. Desalination of seawater is becoming more cost effective uh, uh, through time. So Egypt has, uh, needs to accept the fact that Ethiopia also needs uh, a share of its uh, own resource, a, a resource that we contribute 70, uh, more than 86 percent to. And we also have our own lives to protect. We also have our own uh, poverty to, to alleviate. Uh, and we have these things. And Egypt has to understand that it cannot continue with these colonial arrangements anymore. And they have to accept uh, that Ethiopia is also going to share uh, the pie. Th th that's uh, a fact. I mean, uh, if that is really not the case, then Ethiopia is always have always been open for compromise, and w w we're not looking for any war. We're just looking uh, for ways of alleviating poverty that is in our country. We just want to prosper. We just want to have a, a decent way of life. That's what the Ethiopians are after. We're not looking for any conflicts, and we are asking for our rights that has been snatched away back in history. And it, we're not asking for someone else's rights. We're not trying to uh, so you're asking for uh, cause harm on Egyptians or Sudanese. No, we, 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 it, this is actually a beneficial for all. But Egypt has to curve down on its narrative of, uh, I own the Nile, and the, the Nile is an Egyptian thing. That has, to, I mean, it does not work anymore. We're not living in a colonial era. Okay. I think the, the realizing that would be a very good thing. All right. Uh, I mean, we can have a discussion on this for hours, but unfortunately, we are running out of time. Mr. Isaac, issue to Aragov, uh, Mr. John Mukum Mbaku, and Mr. Ashok Swain. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us today on this episode of The Brief. We really appreciate your analysis. Please stay safe, stay healthy. And on that note, this brings us to the end of another episode of The Brief. Stay tuned on A News. News will continue on the hour, and I'll be back with you with another episode of The Brief next week.